We often hear about and cover the struggles that many Americans face when they try to land a good job. If you have a disability, the challenge of getting hired or even getting a response to an inquiry, much less a face-to-face -face interview, is significantly harder. Our economics correspondent, Paul Salman, explores why that is still happening. It's part of his weekly series, Making Sense. Good evening. My name is Ami Profeta. Ami Profeta has cerebral palsy. He's been looking for work for over a year. People have hung up the phone. They don't respond to my emails. Profeta's job hunt may be more challenging than most. The unemployment rate for those with a disability is more than double the rate for those without. We interviewed economist Douglas Cruz, himself a paraplegic, via Skype. It's not just a matter of people with disabilities you know, staying at home and uh, collecting disability income. It's a matter of people who want to work uh, are not as easily able to find work. In a 2015 study, Cruz's research team submitted 6,000 fake online job applications for accounting positions. One third said the applicant had a spinal cord injury, another third Asperger's syndrome, and one third did not mention a disability at all. The results? People with disabilities um, were 26 percent less likely to get expressions of employer interest. What's going on, do you suppose? There's a lot of discomfort with people with disabilities. I think apart from that, there's a lot of uncertainty. Oh, geez, someone in a spinal cord injury, um, I'm not sure they're going to fit in here. They refer to it as fear of the unknown. Mason Ameri co-authored the study. How do I know if this person can do the job? How do I know the cost? So all of these unknowns ultimately compel an employer to express uh, you know, no hiring intent. Even though the Americans with Disabilities Act bars such discrimination for firms with more than 15 employees. Nicole Ellis returned to the job market after the bank she worked at went bust. But she decided to leave off her resume the fact that she's legally blind due to ocular albinism. I didn't think that I would be able to get my foot in the door. It still took three and a half years to land a job here at Liberty Resources, a Philadelphia nonprofit which promotes independent living for the disabled. I would get the calls back. I would go on the interviews. And once you start discussing, because I have to let them know that I'm going to need these accommodations, mm -hmm. like software that enlarges font or enhances speech recognition. So once you start talking about those things, it, it kind of becomes like dead silence almost. Really? You and can they, feel it? You can feel it. And then they'll give you some other scenarios as far as, well, what, what about, uh, let's say, if it snows, are you going to be able to get into work? But you can understand, or can you not understand, why an employer would be concerned about all those sorts of things? I do understand. Um, but on the other hand, I've worked around people who do not have disabilities, who do not come to work, <laughs> and who do not work. So, I mean, it, to me, I understand the, the doubt and the question, but you are discriminating just based on the what-ifs of someone's disability. Liam Doherty has a master's in public administration from the University of Pennsylvania and ataxia, a condition marked by a lack of muscle coordination. The way that disability affects, affects employment is more, more insidious, more subtle, more insidious. My resume has all these gaps in there. And so I think an employer looks at that and they see, you know, like, why has this guy not been working? So the gaps in your work history and the kinds of work you haven't done are kind of signals, you think? Definitely. Doherty, like Ellis, also found work here at Liberty. Bill Krebs says employers have always underestimated him because of his intellectual disability. At one time it was the R word. We got rid of the R word. It's mental retarded. So I was labeled with a mental retardation. My IQ is mild, so I was IQ of 70. When you're labeled with a disability, it's like hitting a ditch to the Jews. They put a tattoo on your arm. And that stigma stays for the rest of your life. So once you're stigmatized, then... That's it. You're out of the you're game. Out, you're out of the game, no matter how hard you try. Until he, too, found a niche at Liberty where disability is a commanplace. Yes, 
But what prompted this story is a second and more surprising finding of the crew's Ameri research. Early results show that when they sent applications just for jobs in data entry and software development. So we found no evidence of discrimination. None. None, at least not with the preliminary data. And why might that be? We went looking for a case study in the real world and found one in Philadelphia at an accounting firm. We make a concerted effort now. We're going to universities, speaking to the people responsible for their students with disabilities. Steve Howe is managing partner for EY Americas, formerly Ernst & Young. The, the goal is that pass, that certification. In a pilot program, it's pushing to hire more people with autism, a group that has had up until now an estimated un- and underemployment rate of between 70 and 90 percent. But, says Sam Briefer, We all bring something to, to the table that a lot of people cannot. We are very detail-oriented. We analyze things in a very specific way. Briefer is one of four recent hires here with autism spectrum disorder. There are others that are very more detail-oriented than, than I am <laughs> and are much better that, with numbers. Well, it's an accounting firm, I guess. <laughs> Being good with numbers is probably a good thing. It is, it is. Um, so it puts us all at a, at a huge advantage. But of course, people on the spectrum typically have trouble socializing, communicating, an obvious handicap. W were you nervous about taking the job? I, I was, yes. I first thought that I would be com communicating with a lot of people at once, uh -huh. which is something that I always get stressed about. But knowing that I, I work independently a lot um, m makes me feel a lot better with where I work. When things do get stressful, EY brings in a job coach to help. The team's regular manager, Jamel Mitchell, got neurodiversity training ahead of time but he's also learning on the job. They're very specific and very clear, as opposed to possibly a neurotypical person that may try to slide in at 9, 10. The folks that are on the spectrum will say, hey, I arrived at 9.02 today. Do I need to work until 6.02 today? And your reaction to that? Don't worry about the two minutes, we're okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people on the spectrum tend to be, or at least initially, more rigid in their, in some other thinking. But, says program participant Stan Huang, this form of rigidity has a major upside. It also tends to make them want to be more honest, I think. What would be the, the point of, like, lying about something or being deceptive? Because you're more naturally just straightforward. Yes. Managing partner Howe recently gave the team behind the pilot program a Better Begins With You award. Well, thank you all very much. But look, this isn't about feel-good inclusivity so much as boosting the bottom line. Howe hopes to leverage the special abilities he's seen in his workers with autism. We've learned from technology companies like SAP, Microsoft, HP, who have hired people with these kind of skills. We think it's a rich talent pool and we're gonna expand this now from this exercise in Philadelphia to three or four other cities in the next year and scale this up. And that means more job prospects for people on the spectrum, like Stan Wong. No matter uh, what kind of uh, functionality a person may be, everyone uh, wants to be treated like a human being. Everybody deserves an opportunity. And at long last, in certain jobs, they're getting one. But for those with disabilities who don't seem to provide a profit advantage, many still seem to be on their own. Employers do not respond. This is economics correspondent Paul Salman reporting from Philadelphia. A wonderful report. And one more note, Paul's team reached out to several major groups representing employers, large and small, to hear their take. Some did not respond. Others said that they will start to consider ways of tackling this problem.